Hello. Oh. I love the warm chatter of connecting with each other in person. It is great to be here together. Hello and welcome to Neighborhood Unitarian Universalist Church in Pasadena. Welcome all members, friends, and guests here together in the sanctuary and, on, uh, and virtually with YouTube. Neighborhood Church creates and grows an inclusive community of faith connected by love, spirit, and service. We acknowledge our presence on the ancestral and unceded territory of the Gabrielino Tongva peoples, the traditional caretakers of the land and waters of this campus. We honor the elders who lived here before, the indigenous peoples today, and the generations to come. My name is Elizabeth Sadlon. I'm a member of your board of trustees. Today's service is led by our interim minister, Reverend Dr. Teresa Cooley, with music by our music director, Dr. Zaneda Robles, Ann Wells Lang, and Michael Fausto. Please take a moment to silence your devices as we begin our service. Thank you for, for joining us as we continue to prioritize connection over perfection in this hybrid service, which is streamed and recorded on YouTube. Based on guidance from our COVID safety team, masks are recommended, though optional for congregants inside and are optional outside. Families with young children are welcome in the sanctuary, in the narthex, or in our new family lounge located in the living room of Neighborhood House, where the service is live streamed on a big screen. The lounge is staffed by a host to help you feel at home. Today, after service, on the patio outside, you can sign up for chalice circles and learn about get out the vote letter writing um, on the tables right outside here. This is the last week to complete the ministerial search survey, which takes a snapshot of our community and collects our hopes for our new minister. Our order of service and more extensive announcements are now available as a link in the Sunday email um, the order of service is posted on the door on um, the North X, and you also have a QR code on the back of your hymnals where you can access the order of service and the detailed announcements if you'd like to. You can always get more information, low-tech way, at the welcome table outside anytime um, and on any of these activities and many more. Again, welcome to Neighborhood Church, whoever you are, wherever you are in your spiritual journey. Welcome to this inclusive faith community connected by love, spirit, and service.
I love that we can do this now. Let us greet one another. Say hello to somebody near you that you don't know. You can do it. You can do it. You can get up. Say hi. Bring a little warmth to an otherwise chilly morning. O oh, thou nameless, named in so many ways by all of us, give wings to our heart and set free the ancient joys within us. Lift the veils of sleep from our minds with care and let outward morn be called to inward dawn. We are here to worship, to join in singing an alleluia that we did not begin and which we shall not complete. To take our part in a play of praise, a rhythm of revelation, a merciful art, that it might give shape to our longing for you O oh, love, our way and our end. Set free within us our gifts to bless and be blessed. Set the day before us as a splendid, holy gift and bless these hours with thy participation and the quickening of our devotion. We are here. Let us worship together. Good morning and welcome to our first 1130 service of the new church year. So yeah, woo! Our 1130 folks are the ones that typically get to experience our choir in all of its glory. You'll see the choir is not present in its glory today. That's because the choir typically sings three of the four Sundays out of the month regular usually so um, when the choir is off many of our choir members are out there with you all so we expect some really hearty singing and also <laughs> I want to encourage you that if you feel your your heart beating really fast because you, you're enjoying the the sounds you're making and the feeling you're getting you might be, be being called to be a part of the choir so especially if you're a tenor or a bass so I want to encourage that. One last uh, note, today at one o'clock our youth choir will be meeting for the first time and we're so excited to have some young people that are going to be offering music in a couple of weeks for, for this service and that is also just to say that that means after our 11:30 service today y'all kind of got to get out a little bit so we can have our rehearsal because we're going to get started on time. <laughs> In any case, we're so happy you're here. This is, a, this is a, a church that loves to sing and I can't wait to hear you lift your voices. Will you join me rising in body or in spirit? And let's sing our opening hymn number 100. I've got peace like a river.
Good morning. My name is Matt Vasco. I'm the Director of Religious Education, and it is my joy to tell you that the regular church year religious education returns today! And on this first day of youth religious education, we want to take a moment to dedicate and commission those among us who have chosen to take on the important responsibility for teaching or advising our children and youth. At this time, I invite all of those here who are going to help lead youth religious education this year to please come forward. I see you there in the back. Come on up. And, and will our children and youth please come stand with them? Yeah. Come join them, kids. <laughs> now, I, I have to issue a little disclaimer at this time and say that our eight, nine owl class, grades eight and nine owl class, and our rites of passage class and our senior high group are all presently meeting. So if it looks a little sparse or not as big as you'd expect, it is because we have three groups missing right now that uh, started a little bit earlier. So I apologize that they're not with us and I thank those of you who are able to be here. Our children and youth in middle school and lower will be starting in service with us each Sunday this church year, so we can all look forward to that. Teresa? So to you as teachers and advisors, you can turn around a little bit. Hi. <laughs> I'm so very happy to see you all here. Let me say this to you. In taking on this responsibility, you have committed yourself to nurturing the spirits of the youngest members of our congregation sometimes at the sacrifice of your own participation in church. And we believe that teaching our young ones is its own kind of spiritual growth. So I ask you, do you promise now before these children and this congregation to do your best to honor them, to teach them, to nurture their religious growth as Unitarian Universalists as well as your own? If so, say, we do. We do. And do you the children and youth gathered here with us this morning promise to open your minds and hearts to the lessons these teachers and advisors offer to honor their dedication and to participate regularly? If so, say, we do! <laughs> Thanks, Jacob. <laughs> And do you, the Congregation of Neighborhood Church, promise these teachers and young people your support, knowing that religion cannot be taught only in a classroom, but also encouraged in the larger church community? If so, say, we do. We do. So please take up the challenge of this good work. May you have fun and grow and learn together and being a continuing example of the importance of religious growth both to us gathered here and to the world beyond. You may go in peace as we sing you out. Amen. This is the morning for commissioning ceremonies. We're going to commission the wonderful Ministerial Search Committee, and so I'm gonna ask you to come up and stand.
last May, we as a congregation elected these amazing seven members to serve on our ministerial search committee. They are Mary Favre Holmes, Ben Lopez, indicate yourself as I go, Sarah Marcotte, Lynn Miyamoto, Louisa Villeneuve, Paul Wallace, and Margaret Wilcox. Hooray! <laughs> These amazing people were chosen through an intentional process facilitated by the transition team, plus two members of the board and one member of the nominating committee. And, and they said yes, hooray. You were selected because we trust you to discover and represent the best interests of the congregation as a whole, not a smaller constituency of those who may agree with your point of view, you were chosen because we trust you to carry forward the best part of the past and keep your sights on the future. Uh, search committee members, you have already begun a journey of getting to know one another's hopes and dreams for the church, one another's styles of communication and one another's ways of working with others. You know how essential it is to, be work, to work well with one another however different your styles and perspectives may be. In the months to come, you will be helping this congregation to understand itself better and to discern what it wants and needs in its next ministerial leader. You may even have to learn some new skills. You will have the fascinating experience of learning about and communicating with a number of ministers who are in search for a new congregation to serve. We are grateful to you for your dedication to this congregation and for your commitment to this long and at times intense process. So now I ask the members of Neighborhood Church to affirm this commission with the words that will be on your screen. We offer our gratitude for this enormous effort on our behalf. We commit ourselves. So now I ask you, the members of this search committee, you can turn around. I ask you to pledge yourselves to work collaboratively with one another, to listen to the congregation's needs and desires for ministry, to share information about the process, and to engage with candidates with integrity. I know you are already mindful of these obligations. And so I ask you to affirm them again by saying, we will. Thank you again for your great service to this community. Giving is a spiritual practice through which we put our values into action. Each Sunday, our congregation dedicates 100% of contributions to a local social justice organization. If you're visiting for the first or second time, welcome, you're our guests. Please let the plate pass you by. The plate is back, very exciting. If you're a member and wish to make a payment toward your pledge, make a note in the subject line or use an envelope available at the donation box outside. This week, our gifts go to Girls on the Run of Los Angeles County, and here to tell us about them is Lynn Miyamoto and Kevin? Kevin in spirit, Lynn Miyamoto. Girls on the Run is a positive youth development and empowerment program for girls in the third through eighth grades that helps girls face negative societal pressures. Girls on the Run combines physically tr training for a 5K run with values-based lessons that teach competence, compassion, and self-worth. The program nurtures social, emotional, and physical well-being, building resilience and strength, preparing girls to make positive contributions in their communities. 
So my husband Kevin and I have been supporting Girls on the Run for many years, and I just want to tell you a quick story of something that really um, moved me about the power of what this program can do. So I used to serve on a committee called, um, um, it's, it's for, well, it's a committee at a school district for students that aren't showing up to school, the Students Attendance Review Board. And there was a young girl who was in elementary school who was not attending school. And so it was the point in time where the group had to get together and make a decision about what was going to happen. And the parents had to come also to this particular conversation, but it was everybody in the community. And what was suggested to this young girl was, would she come to school if they offered to her to be able to be in the Girls on the Run program? Her eyes lit up. The parents were so relieved when she said yes when she found out that she could be part of this program. And for me, that really moved me because it wasn't really school that was motivating to come. There was something else, that she could be in community with some other young girls, that there could be some mentorship, and it was something different. And that actually motivated this young girl to go back to school. And what a relief to the parents because they felt the support of the community to be there in this organization. So please give um, as able as you are. And I know that all the funds that are available will go to um, a good use to these young girls. So thank you so much.
Michael. Let us gather in the spirit of prayer, <clears throat> a reflection of meditation. Let us ground our bodies and open our spirits. All things rise again. I know that this is somehow true and do not need to understand the physics to believe it. Seeds in the ground, the last moon of summer, the prayer you whispered when there was no one else in the room. So pitch yourself toward what will not be finished in the visible world. Work for those seeds in the ground and the birds that cannot yet fly. Work for the home of the ones not yet born and the ones whose bare feet have touched earth for 100 years. Work for what you thought you had lost and what will not go unnoticed by eyes other than your own. All things rise again. Amen. Texture so entwined. 
When I was in senior leadership at the Unitarian Universalist Association, our denominational headquarters, a number of years ago, one of the primary projects that I was put in charge of was called Congregations and Beyond. Like every other denomination, we were becoming aware that our culture is becoming more and more secular. Mainline religions have been hemorrhaging members for decades. And while mostly we <clears throat> Unitarian Universalists have held steady for the past decade, not quite sure what happened after COVID, but we'll see, we did know that according to public polls, there were three times as many people who called themselves Unitarian Universalists than were members of our congregations. What's that about? We figured that some of it was simply the fact that we don't have congregations everywhere. So if someone was part of a church in one part of the country and then moved to another that didn't have a church, they were out of luck. But a much bigger part of the story was that there are lots of people out there who share our values and like what we stand for, but they don't necessarily want to be a part of a brick and mortar church. Young people who grew up in our church schools sometimes don't really resonate with adult church. I remember at one point going to an Apple store to buy something from work for work, and when I showed my credit card that said Unitarian Universalist Association to the young woman who was helping me, she just lit up and she said, I'm a UU, and she pulled up her pants leg and showed me the chalice tattoo on her ankle. <laughs> And I said, great, do you go to a church around here? And she said, oh, God, no. <laughs> I haven't been to a church in years. So even for what is arguably the most disorganized of organized religions, <laughs> we have been losing people who found us too religious. People who share a similar spiritual perspective but don't find much of that spiritual expression in our congregations. So let me pause at this point and say what I mean by religious and what I mean by spiritual. There's debate about where the word religion finds its source. There's the Latin religio, which implies respect for what is holy. Or the Greek religare, E-R-E, which could mean to read and go through again and again, or religare, G-A-R-E, that could mean to bind together. All of these meaning, meanings, I think, have come together to represent what we th think we know about religion, a system of thought, a way of worshiping, and over time, we have tended to connect that understanding of religion to institutions. The institution of a denomination or a major religion. So the word has become bound up with implications of rules and regulations, of dogma and strict interpretations. And so we can imagine why that way of thinking became anathema to those who want to have a more open and less rigid way of thinking. Spiritual, on the other hand, speaks more to our individual experience. Ralph Waldo Emerson said, by spiritual, I do not mean religious in any formal sense, but simply progress to goodness. I mean, essentially, the ability to love and the ability to experience life fully, to respond with deepening sensitivity to the world in which one lives. When I was re researching this idea more deeply about people that call themselves spiritual but not religious, I was finding that for many people, Spiritual wasn't even attached to anything vaguely religious. In fact, if you look up images on the web, Google images, you can try this, and put in spirituality, 
the only images that come up are individuals. Individuals at a mountaintop with a sun behind them, individuals on nature walks, not a single image of people in a religious context. And I also learned that most major religions didn't really understand their purpose in the beginning as being about creating a spiritual experience. It's not that people didn't find spiritual resonance in the rituals and the celebrations that they found there, but for the monotheistic religions in particular, they were about creating adherence to a certain way of thinking and a belief structure. So that's why there were mystical elements of each of them that developed for people who really wanted a spiritual experience. This is probably at the root of evangelicalism in Christianity, of the Kabbalah in Judaism, Sufism in Islam. All of these movements were developed for people who wanted to go much deeper into their spiritual experience in a way that they didn't necessarily find in day-to-day -day worship. And for people who had painful associations with what they experienced as the rigidity of their religious upbringing, the idea of religion got thrown out with the bathwater. There's a cartoon that shows the baggage claim area of an airport with a sign over it that says, emotional baggage claim and out come bags labeled alcoholic father, emotionally distant mother, Sister Ursula at Sacred Heart School and her ruler. <laughs> sisters get such a bad name. I know really wonderful sisters. And I know that there are people here who have their own difficult, had their own difficult experiences with religions of their childhoods, if not necessarily abusive, just not necessarily relevant to their lives. So to some extent, Unitarianism and Universalism grew out of people's desires to have a more open approach to religious thought. Unitarianism arose from those who felt like they could interpret scripture without the imposition of denominations or church hierarchies, thank you very much. And Universalists rejected the idea of the angry, judging God that sentenced people to hell no matter what they did. So we're trying to create an openness in religious thought. My deceased colleague, John Wolfe, said, since I first began to think for myself and to draw my own conclusions about religion, people have been telling me I was crazy because of what I believed. But here this morning, I find a whole church full of crazy people. <laughs> but in creating this open religious expression that we did over time, we didn't necessarily create spiritual experiences either. Just as there are some who want to let go of religion, there are also many among us who still find spiritual inspiration in the rituals of the religions of their origins. And there are many, and I include myself in this, that crave the experience that comes when we open ourselves up to something greater than ourselves. Something that's not about the words we say or reason or logic, but about nurturing a sense of awe and wonder beyond whatever words are spoken. So I want to suggest that religion and spirituality need not be opposite from one another. By religion, I mean, and I want to go back to that original understanding, to bind together as a community. We are a religious community, not because we share a set of dogmatic beliefs, but because we create a community which continually helps us to aspire to live lives of value and principle, there is a spirituality in what we do. We don't have to be alone on a mountaintop to find it. The memoirist and novelist Frederick Buechner died just a few months ago at the age of 96. 
Some of you may remember his novels such as A Long Day's Dying or Lion Country. Buechner was a deeply religious man who also wrote wonderful memoirs of the development of his spiritual life. And as I read the many obituaries that celebrated his life, I realized that part of what made his work so appealing was his ability to capture a quiet spirituality that was a way of living life. Not someone who gave prescriptions for living. He once wrote, listen to your life. See it for the fathomless mystery that it is. Even in the boredom and the pain, it is no less than the excitement and the gladness. Touch, taste, smell, hear your way to the holy and the hidden heart. Because in the last analysis, all moments are key moments and life itself is grace. He said, faith is homesickness. Faith is a lump in the throat. Faith is less a position on than a movement toward. It is sensing a presence, not agreeing with an argument. As David Brooks said in Testament to him, Bigner understood that faith and doubt are not opposites, but integral parts of the human journey. And he knew that openness is ultimately a more important virtue than certainty. And isn't that what we're trying to create as a religious community? A space for reflecting about our lives, a reminder that we're not alone, a way of, to pay attention to the lumps in our throat. One of my goals in creating worship is just that, to create a space and a time for reflection that we don't usually allow ourselves in our day-to-day -day lives. The author Tilly Olson wrote, and when is there time to remember, to sift, to weigh, to estimate, to total? I will start and there will be an interruption and I will have to gather it all together again or I will become engulfed with all I did or did not do, with what should have been and what cannot be helped. Worship time can give us that opportunity to reflect without all those shoulds, can give us time to find that lump in our throat with glorious music. But even more than just creating space and time, we do all of what we do in the context of a community in which we can feel both affirmed and challenged. When I served the First Unitarian Church of Chicago, the famous Chicago Children's Choir was founded there by an assistant minister. And it had grown to be a huge choir in the city. They brought together people, kids from many, many different backgrounds, joining together so that they could together find the joy in creating music. It was wonderful to have them participate in special services throughout the year. And at one of these services, I repeated a litany, which was designed to help affirm people in their different identities. It included a statement about if you're gay or lesbian or bisexual or transgender, you are welcome here. Something we hear often in our churches today. But for some of the people in that children's choir, it was an unusual thing for them to hear. And several years later, I happened to meet a young woman who was in that choir on that day who heard that affirmation. And she remembered it all these years later when we met because it turned out that she was just in the process of deciding whether it was safe for her to come out as a lesbian. And when we repeated those words, it was as if a lightning bolt had hit her. Not a lightning bolt that would strike her dead, but as she had feared, but a special charge that lit her up with the feeling that she could actually be herself and be in community. Truly, she said, it was the most spiritual experience of my life. 
And it must also be said that such spiritual experiences that we find in community may not always be comfortable. Parker Palmer famously said, community is the place where the person you least want to live with always lives. <laughs> and often sits right down next to you. To be a part of a community in which we may not assume a common understanding of life requires a willingness to receive different messages, a willingness to offer ourselves to others, even when we don't agree, a recognition that it won't always be comfortable or fulfill all of our needs. When I was in the Arlington, Virginia church before this, they were going through the eighth principle process, much as we did last year, which examines our rootedness in the white supremacy of the broader culture. And there was an elderly white gentleman who told me that in the beginning of that process, he was really uncomfortable. He said he had spent much of his life in corporate America confronting prejudices and trying to change things. And this process was making him feel like he hadn't done enough. But as he allowed himself to really take in the learning, not just about his own actions, but about the culture that surrounds us, he said he started to feel broken open in a good way, in a spiritual way. He felt called to try to pass on that learning to other elderly men in the congregation. And he told me he considered himself a geezer whisperer. <laughs> he said, I know they're not all gonna agree with me, but I try to help them see that it's not just about them. It's about the world they want their grandchildren to live in. And that helped some of them crack open. Of course, we may still find a way to nurture our spiritual experiences alone, and that's a good thing. But I hope that you can see that being a part of this religious community can help build a spiritual capacity within you. The poet Denise Levertov puts it this way, just when you seem to yourself nothing but a flimsy web of questions, you are given the questions of others to hold in the emptiness of your hands. Songbird eggs that can still hatch if you keep them warm. Butterflies opening and closing themselves in your cupped palms, trusting you not to injure their scintillant fur, their dust. You are given the questions of others as if they were answers to all that you seek. Yes, perhaps this gift is your answer. So may we find this gift among one another and offer it to others in return. Amen. Before we sing our closing hymn, I just want to um, acknowledge occasionally I will be on my phone taking notes from the amazing sermons that we hear. So if you see me on my phone, that's what's happening. I'm not like that. The other thing is um, this hymnal doesn't have it because um, it was in my office, um, but your hymnals have those, those uh, QR codes. But I might be looking at my um, order of service on my phone. That's probably what your neighbor is doing too. So just if you see, if you see technology being utilized in our service, that's okay. This is where we are today, and we want to embrace that and encourage you to do that. As long as your phone or your device is turned off, like no noise, we don't want to hear beeping and ringing, but we do encourage you to engage with that technology. Will you please join me by singing hymn number 92 in your gray hymnals? Will you rise in body and in spirit? And let's all sing together, Mysterious Presence, Source of All.
If you have come here seeking God, may God go with you. If you have come here seeking the way, may a path reveal itself to you. If you have come here seeking community, may we be your companions. If you have come here seeking spiritual renewal, may you leave here strengthened in faith, renewed in hope, and touched by the experience of love. Amen. Go in peace.